Hello. We are at the 54th Annual Society for Thoracic Surgeons meeting in Fort Lauderdale. I'm Gaurav Alawadi, and I'm pleased to have a very renowned group of expert mitral valve surgeons in the United States. We're going to talk today about transcatheter mitral repair and replacement. First, I'd like everybody to introduce themselves, starting with Sloan. Sloan Guy from Cornell. Vinay Badwar from West Virginia University in Morgantown. And I'm Steve Bowling, Michigan. So first, uh, I want to ask Vinay, can you help us get us uh, up to speed on where things stand with transcatheter repair technologies in the U.S.? Well, really, currently, there's only one FDA-approved device, uh, the MitraClip, and that uh, is uh, rapidly increasing in exposure and implementation primary, primarily for primary MR. Or in, and it, we're currently in investigation still in the co-op clinical trial for secondary MR. However, there are some other devices that are in development and some in pivotal trials that are coming not just for leaflet-based technology but even annular-based uh, technologies. So that's, that's interesting because we have so many different technologies and I know Steve uh, Bowling, I have a, a favorite slide of yours that says I do about 27 different things to the mitral valve. So Steve, tell us how, we, how you see us all combining all these different technologies, how to do one or the other and how do you do it all with a catheter? Well, I think we will and I think those 27 things that you and I do do, we still will end up doing with a catheter and if you think of it, the gold standard for aortic valve was aortic valve replacement, and we took a long time, years, to develop how to do that, and we've replaced it surgically for 50 years. We've now learned how to do it with a catheter, and it actually emulates the gold standard with a catheter. Yay. Of course, that's going to be good. And it's true that when you and I, all of us, look at the mitral valve, we sort of have three things we can do. We can do something to the leaflet in a general sense. We can do something to the annulus. And when that doesn't work for us, or we don't think that's going to work, we default to a replacement. And I think you're going to see catheter-based techniques that are going to re-emulate the gold standard for mitral valve surgery, which is a catheter-based leaflet technique. It's going to be a clip or a cord or something like that, something to the annulus, a ring of some type. And we're also going to have to have a mitral valve replacement technique. Now, my contention is these will become important only when they're transeptal. And I'd like to hear someone else's comment on that because transapical to me, when we're doing it perhaps in the FMR patients with poor function is, is not an innocent or innocuous procedure. Thoughts? I would agree with completely with, with that. I think a, a transapical approach with a thoracotomy is sort of a gateway drug. I mean, we are ultimately headed to transeptal for sure. I mean, that's where the real advantages are. Can you on that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, for all of the pipeline technologies, everybody's heading towards that. That we are all part of all these these uh, early investigations and discussions. However, you know, the transapical approach, still for replacement, is an option and uh, the current viable option. But I agree with Steve that we have to all move towards that direction if this is truly going to be opening up to uh, even higher risk patients and broader patient access. So, so let me ask this, you know, Steve, you've been involved with direct flow, the TAVR world, and now with the transcatheter mitral uh, repair technologies with Millipede. Why is it taking so long with the mitral valve? And, and, and why is it taking so long to get to, to the transeptal platform? Well, I, I think uh, there's a number of reasons why that. I mean, obviously we see in any field, and we see it in medicine, that a technology will replace technique. You and I are all technique-based people. We took a long-term time to be really good at this. But to replace that with technology, the harder the leap is, the longer that technology has to incubate. Aortic valve surgery, I'm not saying it's not hard to do, but it's less perhaps complex than mitral valve surgery. The decision-making making process is... Kind of one pathology. Right, then. and we had one answer to replace it. In mitral disease, I think it's more complex. I, Someone came to my office 20 years ago and they showed me a coronary sinus catheter indirect aneuplasty and they said, oh, Steve, gosh, this is going to fix mitral valve disease and then we're going to go on to the aortic valve. And my answer was, au contraire, Pierre, it's going to happen the other way. But I think you will see a couple uh, things happening. One, Sloan said the term gateway drug. I love that term. And I think we're going to see that mitral clip has opened the door to us, one, because there's now a cadre of a thousand cardiologists and cardiac surgeons who know how to do it. And we also know that to navigate the left atrium is pretty innocent. You can take your time. It doesn't hurt the patients as opposed to doing something transapically. 
But again, the technology of putting something that we need, say, the size of the TMVR, transeptally, it's just going to take longer engineering, but it will come. Vinay, let me ask you something. You know, the, uh, Steve mentioned navigating the left atrium, mm -hmm. and, and we know that all the mitral technologies are really going to be heavily focused on echo. And you are one of the few cardiac surgeons that are fully trained on echo. Tell us how important that is in your practice now, and how do we get more surgeons engaged in that aspect of, of the planning and procedure? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's um, well, you don't go into a thoracic resection without looking at a CT scan. You don't go into a cabbage without looking at the coronary angiogram. You shouldn't go into the left atrium without looking at an echo and understanding all the spatial uh, relationships. And once you do, it's not hard. And the important thing is, it's, this is all three-dimensional. And when we talk about our cardiology colleagues who are my friends and colleagues and you should all have great heart teams mm -hmm. and good relationships, but the they think differently. They think differently. Yeah, they they yeah. think in 2D. Yeah. And we have some, we're blessed to have some really great imagers in some of our centers that can help guide it in 3D. But we're used to working in 3D. Mm -hmm. In that 3D world, this is our comfort zone. Transcatheter therapy, crossing the septum, doing, you know, doing the puncture, making the turn down to the annulus, it's not difficult. It's not difficult for surgeons that can do yeah. more than one thing at a time with their hands. And uh, if we could make any singular messages, grasp 3D um, echo technology, mm -hmm. 2D echo technology, and when you grab the catheters, um, think in 3D and just grab it and do it. I think surgeons can adopt this really. So, easy. Sloan, I, tell us your thoughts on, on how surgeons, uh, what, the, what are their roles in the heart team now? What, are their, uh, what should their roles be? How do they get their foot in the door to do procedures like this? Well, it's interesting that you mentioned transeptal puncture and that surgeons can learn how to do transeptal puncture. I took a transeptal puncture class, basically, a few years ago, and I was shocked to learn that actually surgeons developed the devices used for transeptal puncture, and it was first described in the Annals of Surgery. And so we actually invented it, and there's no doubt that we can learn how to do it. I think there's a couple of impediments to do that in many of our environments. Uh, skills are one, but I think most of the particularly younger surgeons are uh, well experienced in endovascular techniques and are as comfortable with a wire as we are an aortic cannula. However, there are local politics that prevail, and I think um, as we move forward, it's going to be important uh, for centers to get help, not just with the technical aspects of procedures, but also how to navigate the local politics. You think the societies can help with that? I do think so, yeah. yes. And also they can sort of set the standard and with guidelines I think it's particularly helpful. I mean, for instance, the um, requirement that a surgeon and a cardiologist be involved in TAVR was a landmark Absolutely, contribution yeah. that, that made the heart team a reality. We need to do the same on the mitral side. So uh, ma many of you may know the STS is now uh, commi commissioning a task force on transcatheter mitral technologies and the hope is similar to what the STS did with, with expanding um, education for TAVR. We can do something along those lines for surgeons across the United States to get them at least the skill sets and I think your point about helping with local politics will probably take another level of implementation. I, I think that's a great a step forward for us as a society because patients want this technology. Yeah. They really do want this technology. They ask for it. They ask for it. <laughs> and more importantly, when we work together with cardiologists, it's the patient who benefits the most. And that should be very patient focused. This therapy should be the most patient focused. And who knows that mitral valve better than we do? Vinay's right. It's a flat 2D gray and white world for some cardiologists. But when you pull on that mitral clip and you're tugging on it, you know exactly what you're, you know in your brain what you're actually tugging on, what you're pulling on. And so the bottom line is working together as a heart team in the mitral area gives us a great patient benefit. We should stay patient focused. I, I completely agree with the heart team. Let's uh, shift gears and talk a little bit about transcatheter mitral replacement. There are at least four uh, EFS studies that have been done or are being done in the United States. Uh, between the Abbott Tendine, uh, Medtronic Intrepid, Levanova Caisson, um, and the, and the uh, Edwards Cardiac AQ. Um, Vinay and, and Steve and Sloan, help us understand where are we at with those things and what patients are we really going to be looking at for those types of, of devices? I know you mentioned a dilated uh, functional mitral valve uh, and left ventricle. Tell us a little bit more about those. 
Well, I mean, currently, mo most of these devices are bulky and they're big. And so probably the first important thing is we people get hung up on FMR and, and etiology specific, but the reality is I think we're going to all be, at least right now, we'll all be really treating a similar patient in that those that have a hospitable left ventricular outflow tract, obviously the anatomic uh, limitations currently of all technology has to do with the mobility of the anterior leaflet. So has that been the, the limitation thus far in the majority of patients that you've seen? I, I believe so, yes. Now, now there are a couple of devices that are grasping the anterior leaflet in an attempt to address that. Um, that's still early experience, though in some of the devices there are upwards of well over 100 cases worldwide and the majority is a uh, selection criteria based on a neo-LVOT calculation. So, so we're help, in this help new Help us area. understand, you know, we don't see that as much of an issue yeah. surgically, so why is it different for the transcatheter devices? Well, the predominant issue is in surgical therapy, we're addressing annular dynamics, we're addressing uh, coaptation depth, et cetera, and in the surgical replacement arm, obviously, we're addressing the anterior leaflet either through resection and re-mobilization uh, and anchoring to the posterior annulus or whatever technique you utilize uh, for cortical continuity. Not so in the transcatheter therapy where we're just implanting a device in the annulus and so the anterior leaflet is usually left to its own devices yeah. and sometimes in systole it'll go in the outflow tract. So right. a lot of these devices somehow capture or tether uh, that anterior leaflet. I guess what does everybody feel about, you know, the the shift to a, a replacement. I mean, we as mitral surgeons have long been taught, you know, repair should be the gold standard. And, and you know, there have been multiple studies now in different patient subsets where maybe for ischemic uh, functional mitral regurgitation that replacement may be acceptable. So, Steve, tell us maybe your thoughts on, no. you know, does the paradigm really shift now that we're doing on a catheter? So, uh, my contention is that it won't, that the biology of the mitral valve, mitral regurgitation, mitral stenosis, will not change because we've decided to fix it surgically or transcatheter or any method that we do, the mitral valve pathology, biology, physiology will stay the same. And we saw, as Vinay commented two years ago, an enormous amount of excitement and money changing hands. Uh, and because mitral, transcatheter mitral valve replacement was going to, to be the be all and end all of every disease. And I think that was A single band aid take care of everything. I think that was silly because you and I have spent decades fixing the mitral valve and a single band-aid does not fix all pathology. So I think we have to be a little more thoughtful on that. In case in point, you've seen not a massive takeoff of this technology. In fact, actually the number of implants have gone down. I'm an investigator in one of these trials and these devices are very large. If you think of it, this is the size of my mitral valve right now and some of those devices are 50, not 26, but mm -hmm. 50. And so screen failure has been an enormous problem for enrollment in these trials. So I think that was a little innocent of the uh, people at the time, and I think we're taking a more mature uh, look at it, and I think really how we look at it as surgeons, and our input is very important because this is what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, is to think, is this patient best served with a repair? How should we do that? And if not, a replacement. And then you're right, how many size problems do we have with an aortic valve? that we go in there and we have screen failure because we don't yeah. have an aortic valve surgically to fit. That just doesn't happen. So I think some of these are gonna be solved by engineering technology that will be able to deliver smaller valves. Remember, for me, you know, at TAVR, you were just pressing radially outward. <laughs> and so now, and you were, and that's how it lands. But, uh, you know, people took that TAVR and turned it upside down and tried to press radially outward on the mitral valve and yeah, that didn't turn out so well. It's, it's not either. that way. So, but I think the field is maturing in terms of the companies and engineering. I, I think we'll see a solution to it. Sloan, let me ask you this. I mean, most of the these devices have really focused on the higher risk patient. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee this getting into the lower risk population, and how do you think that'll influence surgeons and their practices? It may, but once you get into low risk patients, then results are going to matter, and I think that and the disease matters. So the low-risk patients are generally going to be the prolapse patients for which we have good therapies in the right hands. So I think I mean, that... Has MitraClip affected your practice right now? Well, it's interesting because I'll when MitraClip first became available um, uh, in my practice, I immediately noticed referrals started going to the cardiologist. That was of concern. 
And I've recently looked at the MicroClip data in terms of cardiology versus surgeon performing it. At your own institution? No, nation or okay. worldwide actually. Uh -huh. and, um, and it's actually a very small percentage done by surgeons. Mm -hmm. So that's of some concern. So in, in the United States, it's a right. little less than 20%. But then I noticed sort of a Many shift. At this table. Yes, <laughs> yes. I noticed a shift um, as, as the results started to come in locally back to the surgeon as sort of the, the arbitrator. Now I do think we have a problem in the United States which is large number of micro repairs and prolapse being done by low volume surgeons with a high re replacement rate. And so while there's a and lot of... And we see that actually, I see that with, with MitraClip too. Of we course. See, we see low volume... And while there's a lot of excitement around these devices and massive amounts of money, I think we need to keep our eye on the surgical ball as well and increase the amount of repairs for these low-risk uh, prolapse patients, increase the quality of the repairs, and decrease the invasiveness of those repairs. That's great. Sloan, it turns out the more you do something, the better you are yeah, at it. True. That that's doesn't true. have anything yeah. to do with surgery or catheters. <laughs> yeah. So we're just about out of time. I just have a final question for the panel. Let's take us to 2025, 2030, in that range. What do you foresee at your institution, the percentage of patients that are undergoing, undergoing transcatheter mitral repair, transcatheter mitral replacement, and surgery. Steve? So at that time, I would see FMR 100% catheter-based. But I think degenerative, especially the low risk, I agree completely. I think that will continue to be surgery because we are extremely good at it with very low morbidity, and it's going to be hard to recreate that. Remember, if you have a technique that's this good and the technology is that good, well, it'll switch to the technology, but yeah. if the technique is this good and the technology is that good, it's not going to switch. So I would say FMR 100%. Yeah, sometimes patients drive that. So. Yeah, I, <laughs> I agree. We'll see. Vinny? So I think the answer is in the, we're learning a lot. If we go back five years before we go forward seven Just years, numbers. Tell us numbers. Um, I would say <laughs> it's risk. It's yeah. all based on risk. Okay. So if we have very low risk, I think most of these patients are going to still be done surgically and perhaps even robotically. The very high risk subpopulation, I think that's over 50% transcatheter. Okay. Sloan, what percentage? Uh, my number would be about 30%, but I also think the overall surgical volume will actually go up mm -hmm. because I think many of these FMR patients are not currently being treated. And so we're looking at a fine. large population of patients that we don't really have a good surgical solution for. Those are going to go to the catheter. That's going to bring increased awareness of the need to treat mitral disease appropriately to get with the guidelines. Great. And we will actually see more surgical referrals. And of course, in my institution, they'll all be done robotically. Great. Well, I um, want to thank this outstanding panel for a great discussion that wraps up our uh, focus on transcatheter mitral repair and replacement. And we hope you enjoy Fort Lauderdale. Thank you.